July 27, 1994. It was perhaps the most critical decision of the century. The United States and the Soviet Union on the brink of nuclear war. Now, a chance to listen in as the president and his advisors looked for the safest way out. Tonight, the just released JFK tapes eavesdropping on the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. You probably know by now that Richard Nixon was not the first president to have recording devices secretly installed in the White House. Lyndon Johnson did it, Franklin Roosevelt did it, and so did Jack Kennedy. Today, the Kennedy Library in Boston released three and a half hours worth of tapes that were recorded at two critical meetings back in 1962. The quality of the tapes is often terrible, but the content is fascinating. The world may never again know a moment quite like it. The world's two great nuclear superpowers had moved to the edge of the abyss. The Soviets had shipped nuclear missiles to Cuba, just 90 miles from our shores, as people used to say back then. Nobody in this, in this country much cared that the United States also had nuclear weapons near the Soviet border in Turkey. There were a few days back then in October of 62 when it appeared that Washington and Moscow might plunge the world into a full-scale nuclear catastrophe. What was happening inside the White House at the time? Well, that's what makes the tapes released today so fascinating. The president, key members of his cabinet, and assorted advisors are being briefed by the CIA's top photo reconnaissance interpreter, Art Lundahl. Mr. President, gentlemen, we see for the first time a pattern of medium slash IR beam sites that looks like the things we have been seeing in the Soviet Union. In other words, we get five different missile sites. Yes, sir. The uh, Jake Committee made an estimate that. Uh, between 16 and 32 missiles uh, would be operational in a week or slightly more. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Army General Maxwell Taylor, tells the president that if he's considering military action, he'd better be prepared to go all the way. We consider nothing short of a full invasion as applicable military action, and this only on the assumption that we're operating against a force that does not possess Remember, CIA Director John McCone had just told the president that it would be at least a week before any of the Soviet nuclear missiles on Cuba were operational. But the intelligence community was wrong. What they did not know, what was not revealed until two years ago, was the presence of Soviet battlefield nuclear weapons under the direct command of local Soviet commanders. They, in turn, had been given the authority by Moscow to use those missiles in the event of a U.S. invasion. None of the men meeting with President Kennedy that day knew this at the time. Even so, Secretary of State Dean Rusk had no illusions about the danger of military action. Action uh, involves very high risk indeed. You would have to have it back in your own mind and whatever decision you take. The uh, possibility is not the likelihood of a Soviet reaction somewhere else, running all the way from Berlin right around to Korea. That's where they were on the 18th of October, 1962, confronting what appeared to be an unacceptable threat from the Soviet Union in Cuba and a series of equally unacceptable options for dealing with that threat. Ted Sorensen, who was a presidential advisor and speechwriter, was in that meeting that day. Tell us something about the mood of it. I must say those conversations sound surprisingly passionless. They were passionless because it did not do any good to get excited. The president, as always, was cool, but the mood, I can tell you, was extremely somber. All of us realized that it was the first potential nuclear confrontation between the superpowers, that if we acted too strongly, we could 
precipitate an unnecessary nuclear holocaust. If we acted too weakly, we could permit the erosion of the alliance. I don't think it's any exaggeration, Mr. Sorensen, to say that you had a bunch of healthy egos collected in that room. Uh, how, did, how did the opinion leaders come to the forum? I mean, clearly the president when he wanted to, but in the absence of the president expressing an opinion. Well, it was very interesting. The stakes were so high that people paid very little attention to protocol. Some of us who were there, such as the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Treasury and myself, had no direct foreign policy responsibilities. Some of who were there were subordinate to their secretary who was uh, there, and yet everybody spoke his mind. You know what's uh, interesting to me, and there, there'll be a passing reference to it a little bit later on, you had essentially three Republicans there in the room. The CIA director was a Republican, Bob McNamara in those days was still a Republican, and of course uh, Dillon was a, was a Republican. Uh, a little bit unusual, wasn't it? Yes, but I must say uh, partisan considerations were furthest from our mind at that time. Indeed, I recall a note that Douglas Dillon passed to me urging the airstrike instead of the blockade because he said the blockade will be very frustrating, long drawn out, and the Republicans then will win a congressional victory. I thought that was rather nice coming from him. Mr. Sorensen, if you'll be good enough to stand by, we'll be back with you in a few minutes. When we come back, a young president forced to fill the shoes of his predecessor. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Oldsmobile. Three years ago, Consumers Digest named the Oldsmobile 88 a Best Buy. The next year, they did it again. Ditto last year. And at the risk of sounding repetitive. That's right. Which makes Oldsmobile 88 the only full-size automobile to be a Best Buy four years running. It's your money. Athlete's foot is a predator. To cure it all, you've got to kill it all. Introducing Lotrimin AF Spray and Powder. Full prescription strength medicine that kills all causes of athlete's foot. New forms, same killer results. Lotrimin AF, the killer cure. It's new. Introducing Thompson's Water Seal Ultra Waterproofer. It's better. Easy to see coverage. Dries clear. It's best. The best multi-surface waterproofer you can buy. Beats the competition hands down. New Thompson's Ultra. Not just better, best. Primetime scoops an international controversy. This man admits to killing his wife in the U.S., then fleeing with their kids to the Middle East. Will he be returned? What about the children? Primetime's exclusive jail cell interview, Thursday. Family. It's what drives Bill Morris. It's where he learned the values of common sense, accountability, and helping others. And it's what he believes is at stake in this election for Tennessee. We need common sense in our government. When we're forced to put steel bars on our windows instead of on jail cells, and when we spend millions on air conditioning in our prisons instead of our classrooms, something's got to change. Bill Morris for governor. Common sense for Tennessee. Hi, Gary Willingham. To celebrate the second annual Vinnie Pro Celebrity Invitational, August the 1st and 2nd, you'll have a chance to win this car. Come by the dealership, guess the correct number, and win the car. We've got your 94 Toyota truck. It's a Vinnie special, only $79.88 after 1200 cash back or 3.9% APR financing. And any used or pre-titled program car priced at $8,000 or more is zero down and only $89 a month for the first three months. Remember, we'll meet you at 3 in the morning if we know you're coming. Toyota of Gallatin. Call us now. Part of the pressure on President Kennedy grew out of the fact that his first foreign policy gambit had been a fiasco, the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion. It was further complicated by the fact that Kennedy had succeeded the enormously popular war hero, Dwight Eisenhower. Inevitably, some people would ask, what would Ike have done? CIA Director John McCone did just that. He briefed the former president on the photographic evidence and then asked Eisenhower what he would do.
Llewellyn Thompson, the former U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, knew the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev better than anyone in the room. Thompson recommended a naval blockade and finding some way to communicate with Khrushchev. Thompson is convinced that ultimately that is what Khrushchev wants. Douglas Dillon, Secretary of the Treasury and a lifelong pillar of the Republican establishment, disagrees. Ironically, it's the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who argues that Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba don't really change the military equation between the Soviet Union and the United States. He acknowledges that the Joint Chiefs disagree with him, but he says this is more of a political than a military crisis. McNamara is in the minority, but President Kennedy also begins identifying political elements to the crisis and acknowledges that most U.S. allies think that Washington is slightly nuts on the subject of Cuba, and surveillance photographs aren't going to make that much of a difference. Publicly, though, Kennedy still feels that he must put on a hawkish front. On October 22nd, he delivers a speech on television. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States. Presidential speechwriter Ted Sorensen is instructed to draft a letter to Nikita Khrushchev threatening an imminent U.S. attack against Cuba. Talk about writer's block. I mean, that, that must have been one of the most difficult letters you've ever had to write. In a sense, the letter was a test. Could a letter be written that history would say, yes, that president did the right thing in going ahead when he didn't get a proper response to the letter in launching a attack, probably an invasion, and very likely World War III. The letter was and actually never sent, right? The letter I found could not be written. I tried every version, and every version sounded like an ultimatum or something that Khrushchev could evade. And therefore, we gave up on the letter idea, and those who wanted an airstrike with a letter began to give up on the airstrike idea. Just, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little easier to understand a, a huge historic moment like this by focusing on a tiny task, relatively tiny, relative that is to the rest of this, of this potential disaster. When you were told to write this letter, uh, what were the instructions you were given and, and how did you set about trying to fulfill them? At that time, airstrike was the popular notion. But uh, the, the favored uh, approach. But Bobby Kennedy had said, if we strike without warning, then we have committed another Pearl Harbor ourselves, and Latin America will say it was an attack against a tiny island without any warning. And so the president said, Ted, you draft a letter that will stand the light of logic and history that Khrushchev won't be able to evade or avoid or go tell someone to push the button now and which, if he doesn't respond to within a, an appropriate time period, then we go ahead and strike. And how did you ultimately go back to the president and say, I can't do it? That's exactly what I did. I went to my office, which is a few steps down the hall from his. I spent a good deal of time uh, trying a variety of drafts, and I finally came back and I said, there, there is no such letter. And what did he say? He said, that's what I thought. 
All right. If, if you'll be good enough to stand by, I thank you very much, Mr. Sorensen. When we come back, President Kennedy and his advisors face the possibility of security leaks and of hundreds of Soviet deaths. This is a Goodyear Aquatread with a 60,000 mile warranty and this is a bucket of water. At highway speeds, Goodyear Aquatread pumps away over a gallon of water every second thanks to its deep groove aqua channel. Over a gallon a second, that's 396 gallons per mile. Think about it. The next time it's pouring, buckets. The all-season Aqua Tread, only from Goodyear. We say the best tires in the world have Goodyear written all over them. A new wind is rising, bringing change, bringing the all-new Ford Windstar. A totally new minivan. Windstar is the only minivan that combines standard dual airbags, five-mile-an-hour bumpers, and four-wheel anti-lock brakes. Plus, it meets all passenger car safety standards. It's safety that takes the minivan in a whole new direction. The all-new front-wheel drive Ford Windstar. The future of minivans begins today. Next time, Robbie and Jan DeBoer on Life Without Baby Jessica. Also on and off the bench with the Judge in the Simpson case. Plus Huey Lewis in the news on Good Morning America. Here on ABC. As a kid, I remember picking cotton for $3 a day. Growing up, I learned the value of hard, honest work. That's something they've forgotten about in Washington. Harold Byrd, the balanced budget amendment to cut waste. A crackdown on Medicare fraud to protect our elderly. No perks and no pay raises. Too many of the folks in Washington look out for themselves. I'm going to look out for all of us. Harold Byrd for Congress. A breath of fresh air. When you sit down for a lunch break, turn to Channel 2 News Day side at 1230. You'll get a news team that's on your side. Ann Holtz and Lisa Patton working for you by bringing you the latest news and weather information. Looking out for your interests by solving problems with our two on your side reports. And giving you the latest on health and medicine from Channel 2's Jessica Edds. Plus, practical advice for seniors. So take a lunch break with the news team that's on your side. Only on Channel 2 News Day side. Weekdays at 1230. On the next coach. I vow that I'll never speak to either one of them again for as long as I live. Once upon a time, Luther's best friend ran off with his girl. Oh, Luther, you must have been devastated. Devastated? I was prostate. Now he's back. And back to his old tricks. He always did pick the prettiest girls. Only this time, Luther won't let go. Break it up! Break it up! The next coach. Watch Coach, Thursday night at 1035 on Channel 2. What is chilling in retrospect is how matter-of-factly at one point the president's advisors were discussing the timing of an attack against Cuba. Secretary of Defense McNamara and National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy have been considering the impact of Soviet casualties in Cuba. If there is a strike without a preliminary discussion of Khrushchev, how many uh, Soviet citizens were killed? I don't know. It would be several hundred. Absolutely. No. Killed is a casualties. Killed. Killed. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We're using napalm, 750-pound bombs. Uh, this, is a, this is an extensive strike we're talking about. That question, how to give Khrushchev a face-saving way of removing his missiles from Cuba, becomes the focus of more than one conversation. President Kennedy raises what will ultimately be the foundation for a deal.
Eventually, the combination of a U.S. naval blockade around Cuba and the offer to dismantle a U.S. nuclear base in Turkey, that combination will lead to a resolution of the crisis. But at this point, all solutions are still theoretical. All problems still weigh heavily on the president. On the day these tapes were made, on the 18th of October, 1962, the American public was still unaware of the brewing crisis. If the story leaked, President Kennedy decided he would just lie about it. As the French like to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Do you have any idea, Mr. Sorensen, just as a final comment, how it was that, that what may have been the biggest story, certainly of our lifetime, uh, did not leak? The president called it the best kept secret in the world. We were under strict instructions to tell no one, including our spouses and best friends. Many people typed their own material instead of using secretaries. Word began to spread that something was up. And I have to hand it to the New York Times and Washington Post. On the final day, when they did have some word, they exercised uh, self-restraint and did not print it. Ted Sorensen, thanks very much for joining us. Joining Thank us you. now for the final few minutes of this program, presidential historian Michael Beschloss, who's been helping us go through these tapes today. As I think back on what Llewellyn Thompson said, uh, namely, and, and there were pieces of that uh, tape that we could not use, where he was asking rhetorically, hey, if they'd wanted to hide those missiles, they could have done a better job. His theory seemed to be that all along, Khrushchev had set this thing up so that ultimately he would get those U.S. missiles out of Turkey. What do you think? I think that was part of it, Ted, but I think Khrushchev had something larger in mind. By 1962, the United States and the Kennedy administration had revealed to the world that Khrushchev's boasts that the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States in military power around the world Kennedy and the U.S. had proved those boasts false. I think Khrushchev, to a large extent, wanted to use missiles in Cuba as a way of showing the world that the Soviet Union was back in business. We sort of slid over, or at least I just made passing reference to something that we only discovered a couple of years ago, which is, which is sort of breathtaking when you think about it, that there were local Soviet commanders in Cuba who had... Uh, battlefield nuclear weapons and they were pre-authorized to use those in the event of an attack. They sure were and what that means is that if let's say Kennedy did not have these six days without leaks to make this decision had he had to make the decision on the same day he found out about missiles in Cuba probably there would have been an airstrike and invasion had that happened there could have been the unleashing of those battlefield we weapons and it very quickly could have escalated into World War III. Michael, as I suggested uh, in my introduction to you, you are a presidential historian. You have spent a lot of time studying the decision-making processes of a lot of our presidents. As you, as you listen to these tapes now, and I know you've had a chance to read the transcripts before, uh, would, is this the way conversations still take place in, in this day and age, or, or was there something about that process that was unique? I think the one thing that was unique was that you had a group of people with a very strong sense of responsibility and they were dealing with these issues in the way that I think an historian would like to see them years later looking back. Oftentimes, as you know, Ted, very important decisions in world history are made in a way that's much more offhanded. What is there about these tapes that, if anything, surprises you? I think the fact that the pendulum could have so easily swung the other way. You know, the tapes that we've been listening to tonight are at a moment where Kennedy is basically switching from an intention to do an airstrike and invasion to an intention to try a much more peaceful route. In retrospect, we now know that if that had gone to World War III, we might have had hundreds of millions of people around the world dying for issues that in retrospect really loom very small. What was it, because I know you've also studied Khrushchev's papers, what was it ultimately that Khrushchev had intended to achieve here? Khrushchev hoped to show that the Soviet Union was at the very least the equal of the United States. 
that it could get missiles into Cuba, violate the Monroe Doctrine, and cause a defeat for the United States that would show countries that were choosing between the capitalist and communist camps that the Soviet Union was a very good model to follow. And, and did he not then fail in that? Because the world did not know about the, about the agreement on the Turkish basis. We've only got a few seconds, Michael. He did. And the result was this was seen as a defeat. Khrushchev was ousted two years later, and Brezhnev, the other later Soviet leaders, pressed for nuclear superiority. Michael Beschloss, thanks very much indeed. I'll be back in a moment.